and welcome to the show. I'm Terry Lynn, your host. We're going to start today's show with a clip from Will Smith sharing his secrets to success. You are really becoming an iconic figure. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you make of that? Um, it's what my grandmother told me I had to do, yeah. you know. Um, I was sitting with uh, to Tyrese uh, a couple couple weeks ago, um, you know, just coming off the Transformers with him, just talking, mm -hmm. you know, just about the business and, and just trying to really just he and I get on the same uh, wavelength, so I could be of some assistance mm -hmm. if I can. And there there there's a concept that I don't want to be uh, an, an icon. Um, I want to be an idea, you know. I want to represent an idea. I want to represent possibilities. Um, I want to represent magic, right? That you're in a universe and two plus two equals four. Mm -hmm. Two plus two only equals four if you accept that two plus two equals four. Two plus two is going to be what I want it to be, mm -hmm. you know. And there's the, there's a like there's a there's a, a redemptive power that making a choice has, you know, rather than feeling like you're at a f effect to all the things that are happening. Make a choice. Like you just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. Coming up, Oprah shares how she attracted the robe and the color purple into her life. But first, Jim Carrey tells us how his imaginary $10 million check became a reality. Obviously, you knew somewhere inside yourself that you were destined to be famous because I think it's a really a marvelous thing, that visualization thing you did. Do mm -hmm. you all, do you all hear, read about this or hear this? That you used to go up on Mulholland Drive and park yeah, every night. and visualize seeing yourself as... Yeah, I would visualize... Uh, yeah, I would this visualize, is when you were broke and poor. You know, right, having mm -hmm. directors interested in me and people that I respected uh, um, saying, you know, I like your work or mm -hmm. whatever that is. And, and uh, I would visualize things coming to me that I w wanted or whatever. This and, was in uh, like 1987, 85? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and didn't I you... had nothing at that time, so it was like, it, but it just made me feel better. It made me, at that time, all it really was for me was kind of making me feel better. I would drive home and think, well, I do have these things, and they're out there. I just don't have a hold of them yet, but they're out there. Okay, so you would get this from what, self-help books or whatever? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, self-help section. Self-help section. They've renamed it the Jim Carrey <laughs> Wing. <laughs> So didn't you write yourself a check? I heard yeah. that you did. Is that true? I wrote myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered, and I gave myself uh, five years, or three years, maybe. And, uh, and I, I dated it Thanksgiving 1995. And I put it in my wallet, and I kept it there, and it deteriorated and deteriorated and stuff. And, uh, and, uh, but then just before Thanksgiving 1995, I found out that I was going to make $10 million on, I think it was 
Dumb and Dumber, maybe. Dumb and Dumber, yeah. Yeah. So you visualize yourself like... Yeah, yeah. Visualization works if you work hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's that the thing. You, you can't hard. just visualize yeah. and then, you know, go eat a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That was such a powerful moment for me because I was not a person who did visualization or thought about my belief system in uh, such a practical way. But I learned a lot from Jim Carrey on that show, and he is absolutely correct. If you can see it and believe it, it is a lot easier to achieve it. So thank you, Jim, for reminding us of that lesson. And it doesn't mean that for every person that writes the $10 million check that that's going to happen for you, because so many times people who um, do that process live in the space of wanting and resisting it instead of writing it, visualizing it, seeing it for yourself, and then letting it go. Letting it go, but moving in the direction of working toward it. So nothing happens at first. It's over the process of the time and the effort and the energy that you put into a thing that the energy comes out. Excuse me, could you tell me how to get to the medical school? I'm supposed to be doing a lecture in about 20 minutes and my driver's a bit lost. You go straight ahead and uh, you make a left over the bridge. New Jersey? Austria. Let's put another shrimp on the barbie. Let's not. I read the book The Color Purple and then went out and got books for everybody else I knew. And I was obsessed about this story, obsessed about it. I ate, slept, thought all the time about The Color Purple. I moved to Chicago. I get a call from a casting agent asking, would I like to come and audition for a movie? I've never gotten a call in my life from anybody for a movie or anything like that. And I say, is it The Color Purple? And he says, no, it's a movie called Moonsong. And I go, well, I've been praying for The Color Purple. And I go to the audition, and of course it was The Color Purple. I audition. I don't hear anything for months. And I go to this, this fat farm, and I think it's because I'm fat, because I was about 212 pounds at the time. And I think, I didn't get the call back because I'm so fat. And I'm at this fat farm, and I'm praying and crying, saying to God, help me let this go because I wanted to be in this movie so much. I wanted it, I wanted it, I wanted it. I thought I was going to be in the movie. There's all these signs that I should be in the movie. A woman comes out to me and she says, on the track, it's raining, and she says, there's a phone call for you. And the phone call was Steven Spielberg saying, I want to see you in my office in California. Oh, look at that. That's the cutest beautiful face I ever saw. Can you give me some sugar? Oh, you're so sweet, you're so sweet. Oh, Miss Millie, always going on over the cup. Mm. Your children are so clean. Would you like to work for me? Be my maid? Hell no. What did you say? Hell no. What did she say? Hey, can't you pump that crude a little faster? Gail, what did you say to Miss Millie? I said, hell. <gasps> no, Miss Sophia. No, Miss Sophia, no! Hey, you I had drawn the color purple into my life. I didn't know Steven Spielberg. I didn't know Quincy Jones, who saw me in Chicago in 1984. He was, he was there for a lawsuit that was being filed against Michael Jackson because he'd been working on his, his thriller album. And he saw me on AM Chicago 
and said, that's Sophia. Now, I didn't know him. I didn't know anybody that had anything to do with that. But I knew that I had drawn that into my life. And it changed the way I thought about my life forever. So, oh, my life, I had to fight. I had to fight my daddy. I had to fight my uncles. I had to fight my brothers. Girl, child ain't safe in a family man's. But I ain't never thought I had to fight in my own house. I love Hoppo. God knows I do. But I kill him dead for I let him be me. Coming up, Tyler Perry shares words of advice for anyone with a dream. But first, Jay-Z shares his journey of success. I had a really outside dream of being a millionaire by the time I was 30 years old. I actually calculated with uh, it would take and all these different things and I had no idea, I had no plan of how I was going to arrive at this point other than this very distant outside chance of being a basketball player which was very far because I, I never played any organized sports, I never like really played on the team. Back then that opportunity was very limited because rap wasn't what it is today my small circle of friends would say these stories, right, these short stories. So it was a, a hobby for everybody, I think. I remember the first time seeing Sugar Hill on Soul Train, I was like, what are they doing on there? It was like shocking to me, like, why are they on TV, like, for doing that? Now what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. And me, the groove, and my friends are gonna try to do your beat. You see, I am one of mine, and I like to say hello. My mom bought me my first boom box and my mom's friend bought me my first notebook. It was like this, this makeshift notebook of papers with no line. It was a green book with uh, these little pins that you bend down on each side. And when I first started making music, and that's when I first realized that, you know, I was tapping into an emotion and I knew there was small pockets of people all across the country that I spoke to directly, but I didn't have the vehicle to get to them. You know, I didn't have a record uh, label at the time, so I tried to get a, a record deal and I couldn't get a record deal. The record company would be my bridge to them and they didn't give me that bridge, so it was a very important part of my career that we didn't give up right there, that belief in myself and belief that I had something to offer. So we built our own bridge and, you know, I started my own record company. There was a um, time when I realized that, you know, I got this. I go into this record store to do a signing. It was in Virginia, I remember. You know, it's no big deal. There's no security. There's no big entourage. It's just going to work. And I start signing autographs, and I notice I'm signing autographs for a while. And I'm like, man, I've been here for a minute, man. How many people are here? And I try to leave the store when it was over, and it was a mob of people outside. A mob that we can't get outside. The guys in the store tell us we have to go back in the store. We wait for police to clear a path to the car and we are gonna run through the path and get in the car and pull off and as we ran through the path, halfway through the, the crowd collapsed and we had to go back in and they had to open it again and I knew then that everything had changed that moment. My first album I made was an album called Reasonable Doubt which in the small circles was considered the album like a classic album, like the album for that generation and the voice of you know, people that were going through similar situations, but it didn't sell massive numbers worldwide, right? It was still very niche. Then my second album, because of, you know, Reasonable Doubt and its lack of commercial success, you know, I tried to make these records that were bigger and uh, will be more popular, um, which was a, f a failure. Going for that success really messed up that project and you know set a bad tone it was a huge learning lesson for me that if i was going to be successful i had to be successful with myself i couldn't be successful doing what other people were doing i had to do what 
I believed in and what felt real to me and felt true to me. Because the worst thing to be is as successful as someone else. You know, that's a very difficult thing to upkeep and it's very tiring. You know, I, I feel sorry for someone who has to walk out the house every day as someone else to make this art and to make something that people um, connect to. And whatever you've made is not you and you don't, you're not happy about it, but it's successful. By my third album, I had the combination of failing with those pop records and the true and real music that I wanted to make. And I blended those two together and uh, I made a song called Hard Knock Life. And that album was when I knew um, that I can do it. I don't know how to sleep, I gotta eat. Stay on my toes, got a lot of beef, so logically, I pray on my foes. Hush the still inside of me. And as far as progress, you be hard pressed. To find another rapper hot as me. I gave you prophecy on my first joint, and you all lamed out. Didn't really appreciate it till the second one came out. So I stretched the game out, extra name out, the jigger on top. The drop albums non stop for you. Remember? You can have success. We've seen that a million times. To maintain success is another thing. There's fear in being successful too. You're successful doing one thing. You tend to say, I want to stay here. I don't want to move. I don't want to take a chance and do anything else because uh, this works. I don't know how you learn from success. I haven't figured that part out. Brooklyn, now I'm down in Tribeca, right next to the narrow, but I'll be hood forever, I'm the new Sinatra, and since I made it here, I can make it anywhere, yeah they love me everywhere, I used to cop in Harlem, all of my demons. Today in the Inspiration Corner, I want to talk about something that happened recently with a friend of mine. He called me up. He said, uh, you know, you're contagious. I said, well, how am I contagious? He said, you know, I was spending some time working with you, and now I'm going to start my own business. I said, great, man. That's great. He said, well, when you see it, you know, don't. it's nothing, it's nothing impressive. And I was explaining to him, never, never despise small beginnings. The Bible says that never, dis never despise small beginnings. There are things that happened that can happen out of the smallest little start that can change the world I also he was telling me how frustrated he was because nobody notices him or nobody sees him or nobody will give him a break and I explained to him about in my own life how sometimes sometimes people are out trying they're pushing they're getting cars they're trying to be seen they're doing all of this stuff sometimes God will hide you and let me tell you how I know that in my own life I, I was under the radar for a very, very long time, and, and for the most part, I still am, um, believe it or not. I really am. Um, you're, I, I was kept from a lot of things, a lot, kept from being exposed to a lot of business um, ideas and business situations and business um, um, thoughts or how things were run. And by me being kept away from that, it allowed me to not be tainted by it. So sometimes you have to be hidden. Sometimes people are not supposed to recognize you. Sometimes people are not supposed to invite you to the table. You can't be angry about it. You need to accept it and find out why. Why am I being hidden? Because I tell you now, had I went the route that I wanted to go, what would have happened is I would have ended up in Hollywood and did the deals that everybody else had done, and there would be nothing different, nothing um spectacular about the blessings that I've received. It would just be an, an average um, story. But because I was hidden, because I didn't know how it went, because I didn't know uh, how things were supposed to go in film and television, that ignorance allowed me to carve my own way. I know this may be difficult for some people to understand, but, but hear me clearly when I say this. Because I was hidden, because I, nobody knew what was going on with the success that I was having on the plays, it was all underground. When I got there, I was able to make deals that are, were unprecedented. They didn't think there was anything to it because they didn't know who I was. Completely 
underestimated. The great thing about being hidden is that you can be underestimated. And when you're hidden and you're underestimated, you're able to do some things that will um, not only change your path, your life, but the lives of millions of people, the ones around you, your children, your family. It will uplift and change everybody and everything. So what I say to you is if you're struggling and you're fighting to be seen, sometimes you're supposed to be hidden. It's not your time to be seen yet. Stay the course. Learn what you can. Walk in the path that you're supposed to at this time. And at the right time, God will reveal you, your talents, and everything you've done to the world. In the meantime, prepare. Good morning. That baby is speaking to you. Say good morning. And? Oh, I'm sorry. Naturally, I asked you out here and jump off this table on you. You ain't got time to eat that. Don't even open that bus. will be here any minute. You should have been down here earlier to eat. You're going to have to take it to school with you. I don't want to go to school. You ain't got no choice. And why you don't want to go? I want to ride the bus. Why? Look, girl, you better answer me. Kids be mean to me. They say all kind of stuff about me. And what you say to them? Nothing. Honey, folk gonna talk about you till the day you die. It ain't nothing you can do. Let folks talk, honey. People talk about me. Yeah, because, you know, they used to call a wild load. Wild load. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> That's what they used to say when she, be, when she be coming. Beep, beep. Honey, listen to me. It ain't what people call you. It's what you answer to. Do you hear me? You remember that. Come on. Where you going? To the bus. Come on. I'll be right back. Y'all sit there and eat. The only way to deal with a bullet is to confront them face to face. You understand? Hold on, bus driver. I need to talk to some of these children on the bus. Come on, little girl. Get on the bus. Listen up. This here is a friend of mine. And she been telling me that a few of y'all been saying some stuff about her. I'm going to tell you right now, if I catch any one of y'all saying something, it's going to be me and you. You hear me? Shut up, old lady. All my life, I had to fight. I love Harpo, but I kill him dead before I let him beat me. Who's Harpo? Go on, go to school. Go on, sit down. I'll be waiting for you when you get off. Ain't nobody gonna mess with you. Nobody. I'll be waiting for you at 3 o'clock. Well, that's all for today's show. Thank you for watching. It's like you're looking through a telescope. You see where you're gonna be.
He's gone.